Hello and welcome to MZ Webinars. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, we're very excited. We've got uh, Andy Derman with us, MZ's Managing Director, and Duncan Brown, MZ's Senior Economist, and dare I call them the intrepidal duo uh, from MZ. So we're looking forward to hearing from them. If you have any questions during the course of this webinar, please put them in the questions box on your control panel, and we will endeavour to get back to them at the end of the presentation. Um, you will be receiving a follow-up email with the recording and the slides from today's presentation, so please keep an eye open for that. So, without any further ado, I'll hand over to you, Andy. Hi, Debbie. Thank you very much, and hello, everyone. Thank you once again for joining us, and uh, for those that may be a first-time viewers to our webinar series, welcome. Uh, for those that have been around for a long time, I hope you continue to get value from these sessions and the insights that we're sharing. Um, very pleased to be joined by uh, my uh, my partner in data um, exploration, uh, Duncan Brown. Hi, Duncan. Hi, Andy. Good to see you. Yes, uh, mixed, mixed blessings for Duncan as a Leicester fan, uh, FA Cup winners, but uh, missed out on the the other big prize. So uh, not, not a bad end to the season, I'd say, all in all. Thought, thought we had to give Spurs something to take from the season at the end of it. Thank you very much. Well, <laughs> very kind of you. So uh, <laughs> thanks for joining me, Duncan, and we'll hear a bit more from you uh, shortly as we dive into um, uh, the, the, the core topic of today. Um, but before we get into that, uh, let me just introduce you. If you're uh, fresh to MZ's webinars, just wanted to say hi and welcome and, and to introduce you to what we do and, and why we do it. And ultimately, you know, our mission is, is to help organizations like yours um, to uh, to harness insights about uh, about the labour market upon which to base good um, targeted uh, and, and impactful decisions that will make move the needle on on economic prosperity within your communities. And we're largely working across the fields of education, economic development, and, and employment as as we help organisations to understand what's happening. And there's a whole heap of stuff happening right now. Um, in their la labour markets of interest and then use that inf information to steward the communities that they're serving through through to success. And so we're, we're very excited to partner with hundreds of organisations who are, who are doing fantastic work on the ground um, and never more impactful than right now when there's a, a lot of change happening. So thanks thanks for your work and we're delighted to, part to partner with you. So. Um, if you've been tracking our webinar series now for some time, we've been mostly running monthly webinars pretty much since uh, COVID uh, first announced its ugly head. Um, and we saw this, the impact it was having on the economy. We felt it was important to share. We've obviously been really tracking what we've learned through that process. And in the last few months, um, we've been posing the question, hey, uh, what, what does this mean for skills demand? And uh, last month's uh, session, which you'll find on our, our webinars page and recordings on YouTube, we we uh, dug into understanding, hey, what, what, what shifts have there been in terms of the sorts of skills that employers have been seeking? And uh, so today we will continue our uh, approach to kind of assessing the state of the labor market as, as ever more data becomes available to us. So we'll have a quick review of that and see what's uh, what's jumping out to us that might be helpful to share with you. But as we think about the role that uh, skills are playing in in helping us to, to, to shift through, one of the big things that we've certainly noticed and we'll dig into is, is uh, a changing relationship between employment, unemployment, demand for labor and um, and something that's happening with our migrant labor market, which I think is really reinforcing the need to really think about uh, the talent system and the skill system that we have in our country. And so we'll, we'll start to really reflect on uh, how we might triangulate different data points to start to get a sense of how our current skill system as it is might support us through quite a um, quite a period of quite significant change in the underlying labor supply and demand picture. So that's the focus for today. We uh, can't profess to have all the answers, but what we hope to do is, is to, is to um, highlight some interesting trends that we're seeing and also point you towards resources that will help you dig deeper going forward. 
So I'm going to invite you, Duncan, uh, to, to join us and take us through your usual kind of monthly roundup of the state of play on, on the labour market and give us a few of, of, of the things that you're picking up in, in the data. Yeah, sure. So um, let's start with this one, which is uh, uh, one of my uh, uh, regular charts that I've been looking at these past uh, six months or so um, and a bit before that. Um, so these are your classic kind of uh, labour market measures on the left hand side. So the black line there is the unemployment rate, um, which um, seems to have uh, passed its peak and continued to fall for a couple of months now, which is good news. Uh, the vacancy rate, so that's the number of vacancies recorded by the ONS when they survey businesses as a share of uh, employment continues to rise, although it has slowed a bit, which is quite interesting, because it's still some distance from the levels that we saw before, um, although it's sort of, you know, uh, back to levels that we had sort of back in 2014, um, which uh, uh, was, you know, not too bad. And the redundancy rate, reassuringly, uh, seems to be continuing to fall fast and is most of the way back to its pre-COVID levels. So, you know, that's all looking good. And then on the right hand side here, we've got the beverage curve, which is a, 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 a go-to analytical tool for uh, labor market economists, where on the x-axis, we've got the employment rate and on the y-axis, we've got the vacancy rate. And you can see that in normal times, um, the UK labor market moved along this kind of diagonal line from that sort of, you know, so the green, uh, line there is what happened up to the financial crisis from 2006 to 2009 and you can see as the financial crisis kicked in the line went sort of, uh, down and to the right because unemployment rose as vacancies dropped and then the black line is the the period from 2010 to the EU referendum in 2016 where it kind of returned back to the situation we'd had in 2006 and then surprisingly for a few years after that um, it actually continued to tighten, so it became a, a tighter labour market than we've known in, I don't know, about 40 years or something. Uh, so you can see that unemployment there fell sort of uh, to around the 4% mark and the vacancy rate remained very high. And then COVID happened and you see this headlong collapse in vacancies. So over a few short months, it goes from around 2.5% of vacancies compared to employment down to around 1% um, and then starts to pick up again. But unemployment started to rise now because of furlough primarily uh, the unemployment rise was quite slow and mitigated it normally trails the vacancy drop but it has been sort of relatively muted on this measure and then more recently these past few months unemployment started to fall and vacancies continue to rise although as i was saying moments ago quite slowly but we're still having this movement back up and to the left which is the direction we want to go in the interesting question will be whether the speed picks up over time so that's the sort of the traditional labour market data. And we're going to come back to this because there's some interesting questions around it. But uh, for now, we'll go to our more normal measures oh, on the next. Oh, just a quick, sorry, just a quick question for clarification on the on the graph on the left hand side. So when we talk about redundancy rate and vacancy rate, are we talking yeah. about actual redundancies and actual vacancies or are we talking about yeah. intentions? No, they're actual redundancies and actual vacancies. So the ONS runs surveys to find, um, so they survey a, a, a sample of businesses and say, well, how many people are you hiring for at the moment? And they do that every month. And that gives us a number of vacancies that they estimate. Um, and the um, uh, redundancy rate, I believe, is because they have to be notified by HR1 forms. And so they uh, capture them through that. It may be through survey. I can't remember off the top of my head. Um, yeah. But yeah, so there are actual number estimates of how many are going on in those months. Right. Okay. Thank you. So yeah. So obviously, um, our go-to measure throughout this crisis, because it's not got the time lags that uh, you get with the traditional labour market metrics, is job postings data. And this gives us the UK-wide trend of uh, active postings from uh, the start of 2020. Um, and the period before COVID happened uh, um, is the black line that goes across the top um, and the green bars are the number of active postings in each week since then. And you can see, uh, obviously, we had the sort of 50, 60 percent drop in the first period. Then it started to climb quite uh, sort of uh, uh, reasonably. And then we got to the sort of the autumn period where lockdown started to come back and it froze. And then at the start of this year, as the Kent variant wrought its uh, uh, havoc across the country we had a drop-off 
And then since then, it's been building very nicely and has really accelerated these past few weeks. Obviously, we've seen the removal of some of the lockdown restrictions under the roadmap. And so now actual recruitment is above where it was in the pre-COVID era. So it's actually you know, the recruitment pattern, actual current employer demand in terms of them going out to uh, find new people is above the level it was before we had the pandemic. Do you have a feel, Duncan, for whether the recent um, spikes are simply a case of making up for lost time and they'll settle back down? Or do you think this is we're heading into a very new trend here? I, I, it's impossible to really be sure. I think there's certainly some industries where, as we'll see on the next slide, really, that um, you can see that, that it feels like a catch up effect where, you know, some of the production industries like construction are well above the level last year. And I think that's because they went through a period of not hiring people and not doing work. And all of a sudden, there's lots of demand for construction services because they've got to catch up on work that didn't happen last summer. And there's lots of people with money burning a hole in the pocket uh, trying to buy people to do extensions. So all, all the things I hear is that construction is going really well. Now, how long that will go on for, we'll have to see, although obviously uh, the government is talking a lot about planning reform, which will sort of uh, increase the sort of the rate of building in the country as well in the long term. So that may also have a longer term effect. But we're also seeing a pickup um, back to more normal levels in things like hospitality, as we'll see in a moment, which is really quite interesting. And what we don't know is whether that will continue to go and become over and above to, to sort of play the catch up, as you say, because the, the, there are the, there is good anecdotal evidence of a sort of a, a churn in the workforce there. Uh, partly for the migration reason that you said about earlier that we know hundreds of thousands of migrant workers seem to have left UK labour market and probably given COVID restrictions they might not be coming back and they might not choose to come back they might have decided that they uh, have gone back to their home countries and they want to stay I mean certainly the peak arrival of Polish workers for example was in 2005 and since then the Polish economy has grown really strongly and so some of them may not choose to come back so we'll have to see on that score but um but yeah, so it's quite difficult to tell to what extent this is catch up or that it's a change in the economy and only time will really tell on that. That reinforces why it's important to keep an eye over this and not just assume the world is yeah, rosy. Absolutely. Yeah, and I think that's the thing. It's a, as we get to the end of the roadmap and hopefully that, that you know, for all kinds of reasons that will uh, uh, stay on track. And, you know, come June the 20th, if the Indian variant remains under control, then we um, uh, anticipate the removal of you know, most lockdown uh, measures. And so the economy will be in a place where it can be normal, relatively speaking. Uh, and for, for the catch up reason, as you say, you would anticipate a, an above average kind of period of demand there. And, but what will be interesting is, as, as that goes on, how long does it sustain and w whether it returns back to normal. But if we go on to the next slide, we can see the industry picture. And um, uh, many of the industries are exactly as they were last month. So you look at construction at the top right there, it continues to be above trend. Uh, furlough continues to be sort of low around the sort of five or 10% level. Um, uh, information communication, similarly, uh, professional scientific and technical, just about getting back, manufacturing the same. So they're all pretty much as, as we were before. The really interesting thing on this chart and you'll see, so just to explain it, the black lines here are, are job postings with the sort of the, the horizontal line being the, the sort of 100% of where things were uh, before COVID. And the green line is the share of the workforce that is furloughed. Um, and so in an ideal world, and you look at construction and it's getting close to this, the green line goes to zero and the black line goes to 100% or more. Um, and accommodation and food services at the top left, which is a big one, of course, lots of people work in hotels and restaurants uh, and it's one of the worst affected. And you can see that sort of uh, over time on this measure, about 50% of the workforce are continue to be furloughed. So it's still really bad on the furlough measure, but that only goes to the end of March, whereas our job postings data goes up to last week. And you can see that on that measure, that uh, the uh, job postings are now really getting back to near the level that they were before the pandemic. And this is at a time when um, effectively they were uh, um, sort of hitting the, the kind of uh, uh, first you know, uh, openings. You know, on, on May the 17th, we had the opening of uh, restaurants where you could go in, but still with restricted capacity. Um, 
but you know we are moving to June the 20th now and so uh, restaurateurs and hoteliers are starting to think well you know have we got the staff in place um, and so you can see that coming up there and then some of the other sectors that have been worst affected are entertainment and recreation so the second one in uh, from the top left the top right even um, and then the other service activities which is two below that one so that includes hairdressing for example are also getting back to normal levels of recruitment demand they've still got high levels of furlough as of march so we'll have to see what happens there but in terms of their wish to find people um, uh, uh, they're getting back to normal levels and of course what we're hearing is lots of anecdotal evidence that they're finding it really hard to find people you know uh, there's lots of stories about it being really hard to hire chefs and waiters and so on uh, especially in our big cities London and Manchester uh, two places where I've seen stories recently and uh, reports that employers are having to uh, consider raising pay in order to find people because it's really just hard to find them on the ground and you know that's interesting and whether that's because of migration uh, as I say, that you know, we've had this outflow of migrant workers and these are workforces that are quite sort of, you know, historically quite dependent on migrant labour or whether it's because furlough is effectively gumming up the works um, because there's a large part of the workforce that are still on furlough. Um, and, uh, you know, that will be a, a real story to watch how it pans out in the, the, the months ahead, especially as the furlough terms become less favourable. Well, it's, it's interesting, isn't it, if you take the accommodation and food services, that the, the postings are high because you, one would assume that the first thing you do is bring back your staff from furlough and then you look to add headcount. Um, so yeah. it does towards that. That said, um, why I think the furloughs, the next crop, well, probably the crop after that of furlough statistics um, will be really fascinating to see is anecdotally, as you say, a lot of reports about struggling um, people employers struggling to recruit uh, in this space and anecdotally I, I've certainly heard um, employers bemoaning the fact that staff don't actually want to come back off furlough they're quite happy to either be on furlough um, or have or, or are clearly actively seeking a shift in where they find themselves in the labour market so furlough has helped them in effect buy a bit of financial space to support that transition and they may still be working through that transition and I think a number of employers are going to face some interesting dilemmas, quite frankly, on on when to cease furlough for staff that maybe um, do not wish to come back or are not in a position to come back. Um, yeah. And so, um, yeah, there's a there's a lot that's going to unfold in that space. And my sense on the job postings is a number of employers not really sure. <laughs> and so hedging their bats and going out to market to see if they can attract engaged workforce um, and, and maybe pick up workforce from elsewhere um, in the yeah. short term. It would be fascinating to find out, uh, and I, I don't imagine that, that they are doing any uh, survey work on this question, but uh, the extent to which uh, furlough is kind of keeping you know, yeah, employees resistant to sort of going back anywhere, we'll have to see. The other side that is worth saying is that there could just be some asymmetries within the use of furlough. So the, the news reports are about restaurants in London and uh, other cities around the country. What we don't know is whether kind of more uh, rural locations, for example, are more likely to use furlough. That, that could be an interesting sort of dimension of this. Equally, it may be that some restaurants are going all out to scoop up the demand that's now there for their services, whereas others are holding off and don't plan to reopen for all, until the, the system can fully uh, uh, allow them to reopen. And so until we know that sort of um, uh, 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 dynamic to it, it's quite difficult to work out what's going on there because, yeah, I mean, as you say, these big restaurants uh, that, that are reporting that they're finding it hard to get staff, you, you have to assume that they're not um, uh, 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 keeping many workers on furlough because that would be a very strange thing to do. Um, yeah. So, yeah, but it could be that there are some restaurants that are going all out and recruiting and others that are sitting on furloughed workers until such time in the future. Now, obviously, um, uh, um, furlough currently covers 80% of salary costs up to um, a cap level. Uh, from July, that goes to 70%. And then from August, it goes to 60%. And then in October, it no longer exists. So that will start to uh, tighten the screw uh, on any employers that are kind of uh, hesitant on this one. But the, I mean, all, all that leaves aside the fact that 
I imagine by the end of June, uh, if the roadmap does come to uh, its full destination as planned, we should see a huge kind of change actually, because you know, we know that there's a lot of pent up demand with a lot of people with money in the bank who will want to go to restaurants and it is harder to get abroad this year. Um, yeah. you know, some people will be going, especially because some countries uh, 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 have got the sort of the, the green list position that allows them to go. Um, but it's the full range of holiday options isn't what it normally would be abroad. And so, you know, there will be more kind of people spending their tourist money in the UK. And so you put all that together. And it, it, if you've got a restaurant and you're not planning to be fully open in July and August, then maybe this isn't the business for you, I would uh, mm -hmm. uh, venture to suggest. I suppose the, the other dimension, um, thinking back the other way about furloughed workers, particularly in accommodation and food services, is thinking about the age profile of the vaccination programme. And there may yeah. be younger profile of worker, typically in the accommodation and food services industry, um, a, a health grounds upon which people are not able or willing to return to work that will, again, as the programme rolls out, um, mitigate that risk and, uh, and enable people back into the workforce so um yeah, absolutely yeah. and you know and, and there's an interesting side of this with the accommodation food services as well that the age profile also brings in that we know that employment for young people has fallen off quite significantly and and some of that is to do with lack of job opportunities but some of it also may be that they've not been seeking the employment opportunities out in the part-time space like they normally would because you know if you are a student and you've not been able to sort of leave your hall of residence uh, while you've been attending your course you'll uh, unless you uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, need the money which of course some do but many who uh, 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 are less dependent on the money will have been less likely to be seeking out those employment opportunities so there may be a, a, another element of lacking labor demand there but the point you raise is right that um, if you've got lots of young employees who haven't been vaccinated yet you can see why they individually might be quite reticent about returning to work in an area where um, the, the sort of um, uh, 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 COVID may still be sort of uh, rising in uh, significant. And yeah, we've seen that. In, yeah. And also um, enforcing, you know, this why employers should feel confident to use furlough to manage through yeah. that period. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And we know that there are certain cities that are very affected by the rise in the Indian variant. But yeah, so this next slide um, is um, something that um, the Bank of England raised in, um, I think it was in the inflation report uh, last month. Um, and that's that we have really conflicting signals between our labour market metrics. So what we've got here, and I've scaled them so that um, they're valued at 100 in uh, the fourth quarter of 2019. So before COVID ever happened in this country. Uh, or before anybody was even thinking about it happening. Um, uh, and um, the sort of the green line here is the employment uh, measure. So it's the number of people in work uh, uh, that we get from the Labour Force Survey, where the ONS goes around asking people, they ask about 80,000 people a quarter, uh, whether they work and what job they do and so on. And so you can see that that has fallen and that fits with the rise in unemployment that we've seen. It's fallen back by about one and a half percent, something like that. Um, and has recently come back up. And then the black line here is a different measure called workforce jobs, where they go around surveying businesses and say, well, how many people do you have working for you? Um, and you can see that that's fallen a lot further um, by something like three and a half percent. This is a quarterly data set, so we don't actually have the data uh, yet for Q1. Uh, it takes a while for it to come through. And so you can see that there's something that doesn't sit quite right there because we've got um, it, you know, a much bigger fall in the jobs that employers employ than the number of people in work. Now, the two numbers don't exactly marry up because one person can have more than one job, but you wouldn't assume that that would have changed that much to allow this kind of discrepancy to creep in. A big part of the discrepancy is this um, uh, thing about the several hundred thousand at least um, uh, uh, migrant workers leaving. So the reason why that has this effect is that the employment data that the ONS produces with Labour Force Survey is reweighted to fit their estimate of the population. And the population estimate takes place at the midpoint of each year. And, um, uh, and the, the problem is, is that 
in the time since the last population estimate was uh, constructed, we've had this exodus of people. And so effectively, and the ONS are, are publishing this on all their labor market statistics at the moment, that these population weighted statistics are almost certainly wrong um, in terms of the raw, broad numbers. Now, um, they're probably less wrong in terms of the rate, so the unemployment rate, but they may still be wrong. And this kind of red arrow that we've got there is the sort of the, the, the area where we're most concerned that there's this discrepancy, that um, there may be fewer jobs in the economy than the employment data suggests that there are, and therefore there may be more employment. I mean, the, the Bank of England's view, I think, is that about half the gap can be accounted for by the migration change. Um, but then there's this other half of the gap which is a bit more difficult to read and it may be that some people uh, are uh, um, uh, you know, uh, um, reporting differently on their employment status to what their employment employers are because you know uh, uh, their employment status may be more hazy they think they've been put on furlough but maybe they haven't and things like that so we don't know is the honest answer furloughs added a huge amount of noise here um, and that's probably leads us to then question if employers don't think the jobs are there even if employees do um you know that gives us a, a, a data point that suggests that maybe some of those furloughed jobs aren't coming back and so if we go to the next slide um we can sort of start to think about you know where this uh, where these job losses might be indicating in that direction and so this is the number of job losses that workforce jobs says by comparing the fourth quarter of last year to the fourth quarter of the year before and it's in line with what we might expect from the furlough data we've seen and the job postings data we've seen so at the end of last year um, accommodation and food services have lost uh, about well, i think it's about 13 percent of the workforce something like that in jobs terms so around 280,000 jobs administrative and support services also a big employer is a long way down wholesale and retail trade arts entertainment uh, recreation and uh, manufacturing and construction all of these have lost more than 100,000 jobs so it's quite significant moves and again more than the employment data would suggest um, and you can see that also some of the others uh, public admin and defense real estate financing and insurance are actually increasing job numbers which uh, you know the public admin and defense driven of course by the key worker uh, aspect of it but if we put these two measures against each other furlough and workforce jobs on the next slide we can start to see the sort of the combined effect of them and so we see that most of them and the, the furlough data is uh, as of uh, march uh, at the end of march this year and you can see on the y-axis that's the furlough measure, whereas the share of jobs lost um, is on the uh, x-axis here. And you can see that you know, most industries, to varying extent, are in this kind of 0 to minus 5% uh, fall in jobs. So, you know, you've got uh, information and communications uh, slap bang in the middle of that, manufacturing a bit higher and construction a bit higher. And all of them are now, uh, you know, with the exception of wholesale and retail, with furlough at 10% or below. So a relatively small share of the workforce. Um, wholesale and retail trade is a bit higher, about 16, 17%, but it's actually job loss is not that great. And then you've got these uh, two at the uh, top left here, accommodation and food service activities and arts entertainment and recreation, which have a huge share of their workforce furloughed and have lost a big share of jobs. And so I think that, you know, we've always had this question going back months and months, to what extent is furlough uh, holding back job loss rather than just preventing it in the short term for those jobs to come back? And I guess when I look at the job losses and the high level of furlough in those two sectors, and other service activities is a bit closer, I, those will be the industries that we'll have to see because there's been a lot of job loss already, certainly on this data, but also they continue to have a lot of people furloughed. Now, there are good reasons for that because of lockdown. These are the industries that have been most affected. Um, but, you know, in the other industries there, it's one in 10 workers are furloughed. So you would assume that that means that most of those businesses are intact. It's just that a few of their workers that have been furloughed and fine. But accommodation and food service activities, you know, 40, 50 percent of the workforce is, is still under furlough at the end of March. And so those are the ones where the risk is in terms of the end of furlough, that some of these businesses are basically not, you know, 
uh, functional. And so I think, yeah, I was watching a, a, a economic forecasting presentation by a, a, a macro forecasting house recently where their assumption was that 10% of furlough uh, will crystallize into job loss. So that would be around 400,000. And so I think that that will be the interesting thing to see how much job loss occurs, whether that redundancy rate starts to shoot up again as furlough comes off. Uh, and then the secondary question is whether, as we see the sort of the growth in recruitment demand carries on, uh, how much that can actually stop that feeding into unemployment. Because we're entering a very strange phase where we've got surging recruitment demand, but we may be about to see a lot of redundancies all at the same time. And so this story that we've been talking about earlier, where you've got uh, industries which are still furloughing lots of people, but finding it difficult to recruit, may take on a different phase where it continues to be hard to recruit, even though people are actually being made redundant. And you know, that, that's not our experience of sort of uh, labour market disruption normally. Normally everything goes bad at once, whereas here we could be entering a phase where we have some bad news of you know, furlough not coming back to life for some people, almost definitely a minority of them, which is great, but you know, a, a number of them. But at the same time, you know, really robust recruitment demand. And so that could be quite a, 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 a sort of a, a, a strange situation to be in as we go into the summer. Mm. So we, it's really just a sign of a degree of inefficiency that will sort of work its way through potentially. So it's just a bit of short term churn and yeah. finding our feet again. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, in many ways, furlough was an intentional labour market inefficiency that the government created because an efficient labour market in last year would probably have made lots of people unemployed. Um, and, you know, as, as we were talking about with the sort of the recruitment and furlough situation, uh, there is this feeling that, you know, especially in accommodation and food services, that the, the level of furlough is gumming up the workforce because lots of them are tied to their existing employer um, and uh, sort of not moving around. Um, now, in efficiency terms, as, as labor market economists think of labor market efficiency, uh, paying lots of people to not be at work is a real uh, problem for inefficiency. But of course, we also know that labor market matching is really quite costly and time consuming. And you know, uh, high unemployment is often uh, sustained because it, it's difficult to rematch workers to jobs. Um, and so the hope is always with furlough, and I think the signs are good generally, that actually those jobs will come back to life, those workers will go back to them and we won't have to rematch them. But there will be some that will be uh, falling out of employment there. But how many, we don't know yet. So yes, I think I've, uh, uh, I've basically preceded this whole slide in that conversation yeah. there, that, uh, 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 which, it, which was uh, far-sighted of me, of course. Uh, yeah, so to sum up, recruitment demand continues to pick up and is finally reaching those kind of consumer-facing service sectors, which is great to see. And that's even before we've got the full opening, uh, uh, which will happen in June, hopefully. Um, uh, all those anecdotal reports circulating about some of these jobs being hard to fill, which especially in big city hospitality, and that's really interesting because they're also sat on lots of furloughed workers. Uh, uh, this bigger loss of jobs than employees and how and you know, missing migrant workers, but that doesn't seem quite enough. There may be more job loss out there than we know and furlough remains high, but it is only to the end of March. So before the reopening really started, and this question of how many of those are dead jobs walking, as I put it there in rather insensitive terms, maybe. Um, and um, uh, so, yeah, how to square it all. I, I think this is just a strange labour market and it's outside of our experience because, as I say, normally um, uh, um, recruitment stops and people lose their jobs all at the same time. And yeah. then recruitment starts when there are a lot of unemployed people and that soaks it all up. Whereas now we're going to end up with this very kind of odd circumstance where recruitment demand is going gangbusters um, and actually some of those uh, uh, furloughs may not return as jobs. So yeah, it's going to be a, a, an interesting one to monitor as the months go on. Yeah, very interesting. Thank you, Duncan. Uh, really, really interesting insights. I'm sure everyone watching is uh, uh, grateful for, for you sharing uh, not just the data, but but some, some sense of trying to interpret what this might be meaning and we'll we'll continue to track this for sure um and i think the the, the theme of today's webinar of course is then start to think about what role the skill system can be playing particularly if we think there's a bit of a hole to fill in the supply of workers but also you mentioned that matching 
being a challenge and therefore we're looking to the skills system and of course the government's published uh, its its uh, bill and, and white paper around uh, skills for jobs um, and, and a lot to, to come out of that and so um, so really want to come on now to, to start to think about what role the the skill system and, and we're zeroing in on a couple of exemplars uh, that I think best align with the further education system but the science that we're discussing can be as, as much applied to higher education as further education yeah absolutely uh, really starting to think about well what can we can we cast a lens on what is coming through the skill system based on data about learning activity that is uh, is 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 out there to start to think about whether the how big a role uh, those coming through the skill system will be playing in plugging some of those holes in the shorter term. Yeah. So um, I'll hand back to you, Duncan, um, yeah. to kind of explain a little bit more of this. And, and as we walk through a few, a few very interesting data points, which are quite new data points to us, um, to start to kind of, kind of triangulate that, particularly given the, 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 the backdrop that we're talking about. Yeah, absolutely. So let's go to the next slide. Um, so, yeah, I mean, uh, uh, as we were just talking about, you know, uh, uh, th there's this feeling that, uh, you know, uh, uh, um, uh, as the economy is recovering from a horrific bruising last year and at the start of this year, already we're getting this feeling of uh, 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 intense skill demand kind of hitting uh, um, constraints. So, as it says there, um, accommodation and food uh, job postings are up. Uh, um, from 41,000 to 57,000, from uh, that's uh, you know, uh, April to May, and that's you know 91% of pre-COVID levels and rising fast. You know, so if it carries on like that, it will bust through those pre-COVID levels. And as we saw already, construction is up above pre-COVID levels, so it's really, really going fast. Both of these areas, of course, historically reliant on migrant workers. We know lots of migrants in kind of uh, uh, waiter and waitresses jobs and catering jobs and things like that, and also on building sites and so on. Um, and many of those migrant workers seem to have gone. Uh, we don't know the future on that and when they return. And certainly because of COVID travel restrictions, it's not so easy for them to just kind of uh, 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 test the water back in the UK labour market, even if they have got settled status, for example. Um, so um, uh, um, as of uh, last year, the uh, Department for Education has started to publish a lot more data on further, uh, further education, uh, which is obviously really important to us and a lot of our customers. And so we can use that to start yeah, shedding some light on the supply line. And uh, um, I should say that with this data, we're hoping to get into analysts next month um, and uh, in the first form of product. And then uh, over the coming months, hope to expand upon that. But we'll come back to that later. So we've gone to the um, uh, next slide, please. So one of the things that we can do with this data is uh, uh, regular viewers will know or listeners, whichever, uh, 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 is that we, we love the location quotient metric, which is a, a economic geography metric of concentration for industries and occupations. And so on the right hand side here, we've got all the LEP areas in England uh, mapped by uh, the uh, hospitality jobs uh, that are relevant to FE. So nothing that's in kind of uh, you know, the, the sort of the professional level, uh, and, uh, not that they're not relevant to FE, but the sort of the, the core of the FE market is kind of middle scale levels two to five, say. Um, so we've looked at all those jobs and the location quotient, what it does is it says, um, if you've got the same number of jobs, the same share of jobs in an area locally as nationally, and you've got a location quotient of one. And as you go above one, you've got a relative concentration. So unsurprisingly, Cornwall, there is the top for hospitality job concentration on the right hand side there and the east riding of yorkshire and north yorkshire uh, is uh, uh, second there so with uh, scarborough bridlington and uh, york and so on um, and so and then it's a much more mixed picture uh, everywhere else so on the left hand side we've taken the fe achievements data for hospitality and catering provision that's the ssa2 area so it's subject area two um, and we've constructed what's called a subject quotient, which works in exactly the same way. So if you've got the same share of provision in the hospitality and catering as nationally, then you've got a subject quotient of one and the, the scale is a bit mashed up, but you, the, the, the scale works the same way. And so interestingly, it's Humberside that has the concentration and not uh, the uh, North Yorkshire and the East Riding of Yorkshire up there. Um, 
and certainly not Cornwall down in uh, at the southwest there. It's pretty high. It's kind of a, a, a above uh, locate, a above subject quotient one. But yeah, so straight away we can see that there's a potential misalignment there, that we've got regions that are much stronger on the delivery. And East Anglia has got an interesting one where hospitality skills are, you know, important in East Anglia, but not nearly as much as uh, 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 some other places. Whereas actually provision is kind of at the level that it is in Cornwall. So it's quite an interesting sort of uh, pattern that we see. Uh, and, you know, Liverpool City region there, pretty normal in terms of hospitality skills demand, but actually above average in terms of hospitality skills supply. And so you can see how this data, when you bring it together, labour market data can be quite interesting, even at this uh, sort of headline national level to sort of see the misalignments that are there. So we've done the same for building and construction, much more variable pattern here. Um, uh, again, Cornwall really high in construction, which is quite interesting. Um, and the southeast outside of London also pretty high and then uh, Cumbria as well. And then uh, also the southwest there. Um, whereas on the supply side on the left here, it's again quite an interesting pattern that doesn't quite align with it. The southeast is pretty good, pretty well set. So that's pretty aligned. But actually, we've got Lancashire, which is the most concentrated area for building and construction provision in the country. Um, and Cornwall, again, not matching its demand side concentration with its supply side concentration. And so you can see how uh, uh, bringing labour market data and education data together starts to open up some quite interesting possibilities, really. So if we go on to the next slide, and this is quite a sort of a headline one again. And what we've done here, we've, we've broken down the data for everything from level two to level seven so we've chopped out the sort of the entry in level one um, and we've broken it down by these age categories and you can see that um, uh, as you would expect uh, lots of the provision uh, and these are aims achieved so they're not exactly the same as individual people because one worker can be doing more than one qualification one student can be doing more than one qualification um, and we see that sort of the you know the, the largest numbers of uh, learners are under 19 which is as you would expect but also that level three provision is a much smaller share, especially for hospitality and catering. And the quantities here are quite interesting because as I say, these are qualifications achieved rather than uh, individual learners. So the number of learners will almost definitely be smaller, but you know, to meet the sort of the, uh, the typical annual requirement for new accommodation and food service workers, we need about 79,000 uh, um, uh, uh, new workers uh, this year. Now, that number will actually be higher in all likelihood, given this sort of the outflow of uh, migrant workers. And yet you look at those quantities on the right hand side there, hospitality and catering, and even including all the level two workers, and a lot of hospitality and catering jobs are sort of level two appropriate, but we're talking sort of what, um, 20, 30,000 there. So we're a long way away from meeting the labor market demand from a hospitality and catering FE output. Uh, building and construction is closer, but also more of the jobs there are level three um, uh, expectation. And so you can see actually, if you look at the level three numbers, we're sort of 10, 20,000, where again, the number of openings we expect is sort of 45, 46,000. And again, that's not taking account of the outflow of migrant workers. So you can see that on both of these, FE supply has in principle room to expand to meet labour market uh, demand. And you know that's an interesting uh, uh, question when you consider that sort of the, the sort of typical output levels that we've been seeing are conditioned upon labour markets in both these industries, which have traditionally expected to get a lot of their labour supply from outside the UK. And of course, when that sort of tap is turned off or you know uh, put into reverse, if you can put a tap into reverse, which I don't think you can. Um, uh, then uh, uh, all of a sudden that leads to a, a sort of a real demand side crunch. And that's why we're seeing these reports of skill shortages and rising pay. Um, and so, yeah, there's uh, interesting signs there. Again, when you compare demand and supply, that actually there is this room to grow. Fascinating as well to look at the age profile, um, yeah. slightly more um, balanced on the hospitality and catering um, education uh, activity. Yes to building and construction I think it could be an interesting um, data point to track over the next couple of years as we talk about transitioning the workforce and a lot of um, opportunity opening up for um, adult retraining uh, accessing funding yeah. or, or at least loans to support that and I know that's right across further and higher education but um, it will be fascinating to see 
whether we strike a slightly different balance uh, and again whether this this hints towards um, different ways of serving uh, different aspects of the labour market. Yeah absolutely right um, and one of the other things that we can do as this next slide shows is so we picked out Lancashire here because it was the most concentrated for building and construction but you can do this with any area using this data so um, we have used the sort of um, uh, uh, um, the, the DFE's data goes down to AIM level individually. Um, that allows us at EMSI to classify it into our SSA3 um, taxonomy, so that adds an extra layer onto SSA2, and in fact, we've just expanded it now, so there are over 300 um, uh, subsidiary categories there. And so on the left, you can see that the sort of the, the largest uh, categories within building and construction are construction generally, building and construction not elsewhere classified, then painting and decorating, then carpentry, bricklaying and so on. So those are quite useful in understanding where they're specialised and you can use that same subject quotient metric to do that as well so you can see uh, how well aligned Lancashire is with uh, the sort of the different demands of its construction industry locally and you can also do the same with individual aims codes so I use the subject quotient metric to identify the highest uh, uh, the most concentrated aims in Lancashire, um, the award in construction health and safety comes top, um, tiling operations there, so there's a lot of very practical ones there. And so this is just a quick example of the sort of the uh, depth of detail that you can get by looking using this data to sort of identify the sort of the mix that you've got in a region or for a particular uh, college or provider and sort of start to think about where you sit versus the rest of the market. Um, uh, you know, how well specialised you are around these uh, uh, different kinds of provision, uh, right down to the individual aim level, and start to see what the leading ones in the market are as well. So it's, yeah, uh, this new data opens up some quite interesting opportunities as we think about these questions about labour market alignment to really explore what the right product mix is uh, in curriculum planning. Well, I think it really highlights the complexity uh, that this opens up and the opportunities it opens up because yes looking at the headline supply and demand as we saw there we we might see some general misalignments but the, you know, the, the, the defining uh, both education and the labor market as construction is pretty darn broad and we all know that there are quite significant uh, specialist skills that lay within and so getting to this next layer then really helps to to understand uh, a closer alignment um, between specific occupational areas and specific um, education uh, qualification areas as well. So it's really at this level that the connections are being made. Um, the, the previous analysis was just a sort of a, a state of play headline view to help us delve into where we think there might be interesting um, misalignments or strong alignments more generally as well. So yeah, no, fascinating to see. So thank you, Duncan. Helpful to, to 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 wander through just a few examples of what we can learn about that the potential supply coming through the education system, and it's great to to, to track down um, that visible data and similar data um, we have we we've leveraged in uh, higher education as well, which has been a slightly different way to access that information. And, and as I say, the science can be applied in a similar way. So. You know, as we just saw through this very basic uh, walkthrough, we've, we've picked out a couple of areas that we think are perhaps going to be under the spotlight um, as as the um, shifts in the labour market really unfold. Um, we see how things land as, as furlough wanes back and demand grows. Um, and what we can see is whilst you know, a lot of our early analysis was looking more nationally, of course, uh, we really do need to understand this at a, a local level where where the work happens and and the people are the workers are and so um, so be, you know, being able to analyse geographically is quite critical and what that did highlight certainly as we looked at it in in headline terms there was there was a degree of variation throughout in terms of supply and demand and not often necessarily aligning. Um, so, so strongly there so there's probably some some interesting um, and uh, thinking to be done uh, in, in and across the regions and helpful to look um, and lift our heads up nationally and not just look at, um, in, into, into the kind of deeper depths of local areas in isolation um, that 
of course, um, from what we're seeing from the the, the supply, the, the labor market supply data um, is is a real concentration at that yet those young age categories um, and pretty much dominated by level two. So the great challenge is how we move, you know, how many of that is is directly applicable to demand in the labor market versus how much of that is facilitating progression in the education system that connects at a more sensible level, an appropriate level in uh, in connecting into the labour market. So we certainly haven't necessarily come up with all the answers on that in, in the space of a handful of slides, but certainly hinting towards areas I think um, everyone watching and listening today will probably want to take away and think about for their own regions and their own activity. Um, and, and the key from our perspective is that's data that we're, we're very much bringing to the past now and really want to contextualize that labor demand data that we've been tracking for so long. Um, so there's plenty plenty coming, you should keep your eye out for it, um, certainly across further in higher education and, uh, and and looking at it from a provider perspective as well as thinking about apprenticeships, etc. So um, hopefully we've whet your appetite a little bit around uh, wanting to get your hands on data for your area of interest, locality of interest there. And of course, you know, the, the point of sharing this information is to is to continue to reinforce that, hey, we want to help you. Um, we've got, as you can see, we sit on a whole wealth of great insight. Uh, hopefully you're, you're benefiting greatly from what we're sharing in this medium. But um, ultimately, um, our business is about coming alongside you and partnering with you to get get you access to the depth of data. And as I've mentioned regularly, and I'll keep reinforcing, ultimately, um, we want to help you get to the the insight you need to help you make really critical decisions uh, that affect your communities and your local economy and continue to understand where the challenge lies. Um, but but more more importantly, then focus on where those emerging opportunities are and, and think about what role you can play in supporting citizens um, in your regions to um, to exploit and take advantage of the opportunities because there are plenty of opportunities out there and so data not just on labor demand but also starting to think about the education system is going to really be helpful so please do reach out to us if there's anything you want to talk through or you want to learn more about how we can help you in that respect and as we've been talking about the great the great news is we've got this uh, this this new uh, participation data coming through um, and available so we have that data already and we're um, already able to support customers through our research um, services um, that Duncan leads and and very soon we'll start to see that data feeding into our products uh, namely analyst our analyst tool um, which is the window into data uh, for your local area and, and I believe within the next month or so we'll start to see that data arriving um, in some of our standard reports and we'll, we're working hard to think about other ways to illuminate that connection between uh, labour demand and education activity um, to help all kinds of organisations understand what the uh, talent needs are and how well they're being met by the education system and how we can continue to align and, and, and improve on that. So. Um, very excited that this is coming through uh, in our data. And in fact, if, if, if you're as equally as excited, well, good news is that um, we will, uh, we're just in the processes of finalizing a set of localized reports built around the LEP geographies that we've been analyzing here, um, looking specifically at the, the level three um, learner achievements to understand um, the type of activity that's uh, being delivered um, into into local uh, local areas, so that sort of potential supply to help us meet the the emergent needs now as we build back better. And so, um, keep an eye on that that uh, URL. You'll no doubt be seeing uh, communications from us, but you'll be able to um, register your details to access a, a local report for your local area to to provide some analysis there, and we'll give you further insight as to the sorts of in information that uh, this 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 data will bring and and we'll continue to want to talk to you about how we can bring that to you more more and more of that to your um to your work so uh, very excited there um sh that website is just being finalized now so if it's not quite up and running when you jump on it then do check back in the next day or so it, it's 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 imminent and please do go ahead and, and request your local report and really interested there hear how, how helpful that is to you. 
So uh, just turning our attention now, as we conclude this session to um, a range of other other events that we've got upcoming. Um, so our colleague, uh, Will Cookson, who leads our work in the in the economic development space, so MZ's work with local enterprise partnerships and in, in local government and across um, employability services as well, regional employability services. Will's running, he's, he started uh, this week and continues a, a, a focus uh, series, just continuing to think about how we can help a local um, uh, economic planners uh, utilize data and trends, uh, key trends that we're seeing in our data to, to help um, build back better and to uh, manage through some of the challenges that we're managing through in the labor market right now. So um, you'll find the recording for his first webinar, which is kind of a, a understanding that local disruption um, on our YouTube channel and our webinars page on the MZ website. Um, still time to sign up for the next two stages, which are really continuing to, to, to di dive deeply into thinking about how local regions can play to their underlying labor market strengths um, as we re-emerge and then in, tra in terms of tracking re-emerging demand. So please do reach out to Will there um, or, or sign up for uh, though that webinar series whilst we'll be with a lens on um, his community, the, the local enterprise partnerships and local government um, should be insightful for all, I would suggest. So feel free to check that out. Uh, Duncan and I will be reconvening again in a month's time on the 23rd of June um, and as we as we then start to shift um, our focus now into um, the, the whole build back better agenda and so um, the next couple of webinars we're going to start to think about some of the proactive opportunities that are uh, this this uh, uh, government is focusing on particularly investment in the in building up the green economy and so we're going to start to shed some hopefully fascinating light on on what that looks like um, we'll start off next month by um, attempting to utilize data to start to actually define what we mean by the green economy so we can start to track that and look at it following on we'll then start to illuminate more of the trends um, and some exciting things planned there um, uh, before we then switch our attention to uh, the broader STEM agenda, which of course is at the heart of, of, of uh, policy and plans to try and build, um, re-emerge re from this, this pandemic in, in a stronger, with a stronger labor market and stronger economy and putting the UK back um, very much at the, the head of global innovation when it comes to the economy. So we're gonna be switching our attention uh, to very much focusing on these important topics, again, with a view to trying to help you um, navigate your way through the great opportunities that these present. Uh, that's it from us and um, oh, it's been rather action-packed and we've filled um, our majority of our time so I'm not sure we're going to get chance to to review any questions this time around live um, but but um, we will take a uh, look over those questions that you've submitted and uh, will uh, respond accordingly where we've got uh, we can shed a, a bit more light apologies for that we wanted to throw lots of information at you as we close out this sort of stage of our series and we start to switch gears to to think about um the, the green economy uh, there so hope you found that useful please do check out that report please do reach out if there's anything we can do to help you understand um, ways in which you can use our data to to help at this really important and challenging time but a time of great opportunity and uh, thank you Duncan for joining me once again that's all right you and, could say it's my job yeah well it is and I'm your boss so uh, <laughs> <laughs> there we go that's how it works around here sorry but no thank you very much it's been really enlightening and uh I'm really excited about diving into the to, to the topic of the green economy. It's it's something we hear a lot. A lot of people are asking us. We're already doing um, uh, some some really interesting stuff in this area that we're, we're excited to share with you. So I think this is going to be a chance for us to switch our focus a little and and think about uh, some really exciting opportunity uh, based on the the noises coming out of, uh, of of government right now and the wider agenda um, here. Yeah, so absolutely. Nice to look to the future. Yeah, no, absolutely, absolutely. Bring it on. That's what I say. So we'll hopefully <laughs> see you see you in a month's time. Uh, and Debbie, I'll I'll hand back to you to close out. Thank you very much.
Yeah, that's great. Thank you for a great webinar, guys. Very, very interesting. Um, and thank you all for joining us. And we all see you next month, hopefully. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.